And uh, it's great to be here in the Zoom space with you all. I wish I could be there in person. You've said that it was wonderful to be in the space last week with you all. She lives in the city. It's a bit easier for her. And yeah, as soon as I'm done with this uh, manuscript, sending it off, I'll be more free to drive across the bay from Berkeley. Um, so tonight, uh, we are going to crack open the book that we've been threatening to start for quite some time. <laughs> it's called uh, Boundless Healing, Boundless Healing by Tolku Tundup. And uh, I can type it in here. Some of you may still need to get it by Tolku, which means a reincarnated Lama, Tundup. Tundrup, Tundrup. Um, so that's in the chat for you all, and it's a really wonderful book. I've started to read it, and I'm enjoying the the teachings, but also the meditation uh, that he starts of, us off with. And so I will read from that to guide you in the experience of the mm, the meditation that he starts us off with, called bringing the mind back to the body. And so we'll do that in a moment. I just thought I would start to explain a bit about the book. It's a wonderful book written by this teacher who's really beloved in the Tibetan Buddhist community. And so I really wanted to work with kind of a source text this time around. And Eve agreed to 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 really try something new. We haven't done a book like this. Most of the books we do are more uh, philosophical or straightforward Dharma teachings. But um, this one is really wrapping Dharma around this, the purpose or the body of, of healing, healing the body. And of course, the body is not separate from the mind. And so we will also work with the mind. And that's a really important aspect of all Dharma practice, in fact. So when you look at the contents of the book, um, you can just get a kind of a, a high level read on the arc of it. The first part of the book is an introduction to the mind, the healing potential of the mind, how when the mind is um, kind of stuck in, in confusion or delusion or afflictive emotions, then it can affect the health of the body. Things that I think a lot of us have thought about before and are already, in a sense, we're kind of in on it. We're, we're, we agree for the most part, I would think. So part one is about how we can heal, healing the mind and the body, a positive approach to meditation, sources of healing, and so on, benefits of uh, healing meditations, um, and overcoming pitfalls on this practice of healing meditations and so on. And then the second part is actually a bunch of guided meditations on how to, um, they're healing meditations on the mind and body. And that's what we'll do tonight. We'll do the first one of those that's listed in part two. And then the third part is more Buddhist meditations to heal mind and body. And that's, uh, yeah, and then at the end, uh, he actually gives healing meditations for the dying and the dead. So how we can pray for others, how we can practice for others, but also how we can meditate if we are, you know, towards the end of our life and um, uh, know that the, you know, the grand finale is close at hand. <laughs> so... That is the arc of this, and I hope that you get the book and you engage with us, but at the same time, if you don't want to or can't uh, read along with us, that's okay too. You can join the classes and just kind of surf on the coattails of the book study structure of this class that we're doing again. Um, so one thing that I wanted to, to talk about is read from a little bit of the introduction and what I'd like to say from the outset is that you know when you get the book start with the introduction start with the first chapter I would say if you could start reading that this week maybe you already have the book or as soon as you can get the book order it online or go to your local bookstore order it through your bookstore that would be great as well if they don't have it and perhaps the libraries will have this book 
I'm not sure. I haven't looked for it there. So I'd like to read a little bit from the introduction as a springboard for the meditation that I'll guide in a few moments. I feel because we're starting a new book and a new topic, I should talk a little bit at the beginning to set us up and then we'll meditate. Normally it's the other way around. If you're new to this class, usually we jump right in to practice meditation together and then we have discussion afterwards. But tonight we'll do it in the reverse. And what he talks about in the introduction is uh, how important um, meditation is in terms of bringing healing to the body. And he had written another book that focused on this healing power of the mind, but it was so popular and he felt like it would be good to uh, write a book that was more accessible to more people, so he wrote this second book. Um, Here I am. He acknowledges that uh, he acknowledges that uh, you know meditations that are beneficial for some may not be beneficial for all, and so you always have permission to question and and try different techniques. And in fact, you'll experience that t- tonight when I'll give you a few different options for if you're having challenges and so on. So you'll see what that feels like. Uh, And then part one, the first chapter, called Healing the Body, he starts to talk about how our natural state is to be at peace. Uh, And it's the habitual state that we think is our natural state (laughs) that pulls us out of that natural peace that we all inherently have within us. Because as... Semchen as sentient beings. Semchen is a Tibetan word that means literally means mind havers. <laughs> We're mind havers. We are sentient beings. Uh, we have within us the Buddha nature, the Tathagata Garbha that we've learned about before. This Garbha literally means seed, but also uh, womb. And Tathagata means the thus gone one, meaning you've transcended or you've gone from uh, samsara, the shore of samsara, across the ocean of samsara, and achieved the other shore, nirvana. So the thus gone one is an epithet for the Buddha, Shakyamuni, but there have been other Buddhas throughout time, and there will be future Buddhas. The next one is, who knows, Buddha Maitreya. Maitreya, if you might recognize, actually, this is a sweet little uh, tidbit that we were talking about. Last night at the class I started teaching on Tuesday nights at the new Alembic in in Berkeley, and somebody was asking about the next Buddha, Maitreya. You're talking about him and and what that means. But his name, Maitreya, what does that sound like? Uh, We've studied uh, Maitri, Maitri or Metta. Maitri is the Sanskrit word for Metta, which means loving kindness. So he is the Buddha of love. And isn't that great? Don't we need that? The love Buddha is coming next to a theater near you. (laughs) Get your tickets. And he is depicted as being seated on a chair, which is so funny because way back in the Mahayana era when these teachings started to come out and come forth in India, he was depicted even back then as sitting like on a throne, like a chair. And all the other Buddhas are depicted as being in a cross-legged position. Lotus, most of them are, or Tara, Buddha Tara is in the meditative, uh, the royal ease pose. You might be familiar with that. But she's in a cross-legged position, more or less on the on a cushion, not actually on a cushion, but on a moon disc, on a lotus flower. And her right leg is coming forward, stepping into samsara, and her left leg is tucked in close to her perineum meaning resting fully in nirvana. So that's a seated posture on the floor. Buddha Shakyamuni is in full lotus position. So Maitreya is really the only one to be depicted sitting in a chair. Even way back around the turn of the millennia, they were depicting the next Buddha like that. So that's all to say, isn't that funny uh, that we are in the West, primarily a chair culture, even Eastern 
uh, the cultures, yes, they sit and squat perhaps um, on the earth more often than we do growing up in the family homes and so on, but they are also starting to be more chair cultures <laughs> in general. So who knows? Let's 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 hope my chair comes soon because as May said, you know, we need you. <laughs> now is the time, uh, perhaps more than ever. So, uh, Maitreya is the next Buddha. Why am I talking? I don't know. Can somebody remind me why I'm on that tangent? <laughs> In any case, the I know we have the Buddha nature, the Tathagata Garbha, right? Tathagata Garbha is the epithet for the Buddha, the thus gone one, and then Garbha is the essence. So, Tathagata, the thus gone. Garva is essence or womb. And really what that image is, is that we all have that seed within us. We all have that Buddha nature within us as semchen, as sentient beings. And that doesn't just go for the humans. That goes for animals, insects, even gods and jealous gods and pretas, hungry ghosts and hell beings, you know. These might be understood as the six realms of existence, but also could be psychological states. In any case, if we have a mind, if we can go from one place to another, um, it's said in some definitions that that means that a being is a Sem Chen. Now, some teachings say that also, of course, trees and rocks and earth and water and sky have some kind of consciousness. So that's still up for, the verdict is still out on that, and I'm willing to go there if, if, if you know... I think that we we should be open to that potential as well. In any case, because we have that potential within us, we long for it, right? We long for happiness. We long for that peace of mind that is inherently in us as our Buddha nature. Otherwise, we wouldn't long for it. And that's what His Holiness the Dalai Lama says is, if we didn't inherently have that Buddha nature inside of us, we wouldn't long for it. We wouldn't long for that peace, that wholeness, uh, the freedom from suffering, because we wouldn't know to long for it. We wouldn't have that kind of old memory somewhere deep inside of us. So that is one one way to kind of posit that our basic nature is good, not bad, not sinful. And because of that, we uh, have the potential to find our way back home to that peace within us, even though we might have lived most of our life in exile from it, whether it was through um, a challenging childhood or various issues that, that were around us or in our family as a youth, in any case, no matter what your history is, no matter how hard or how privileged your life has been, we all can find that peace within us. And as Tolku Tundip says, meditation is a wonderful way to bring peace within the mind. And when the mind is feeling peaceful, then the body will be more at ease. And then when the body is more at ease, then the mind will naturally feel more at ease and at peace. So it's this uh, loop of joy, as one of the Dodrup Chens said. Um, there's a quotation here from the Buddha himself in terms of the mind as a source of joy or a source of negativity, depending on where it's at. The Buddha said, Mind is the main factor and forerunner of all actions. Whoever acts or speaks with a pure thought will enjoy happiness as a result. And so again, it goes back to the motivation behind thought and a topic that we've talked a lot about. Uh, but really the mind is, is the forerunner. So if we're, perhaps you've been around people who are always in a negative state of mind, it's almost as if their physical form reflects that, right? You can feel it. You don't want to be around them. And uh, But if the mind is at ease within itself, is uh, even has a relative degree of peace, then that reflects on their physical expression, but they're also 
um, will have joy and happiness as a result. And then in terms of the uh, body, Tibetan medicine is very similar to Ayurvedic medicine as well as it borrows from Chinese medicine as well. They blended in Tibet those two really wonderful uh, medical sciences. And like Ayurveda, and I think like the Chinese to a lesser degree, uh, Tibetan medicine understands the body to be made up of four primary elements of earth, water, fire, and air. Sometimes the fifth space is added in there in terms of the space between our cells, the space between the organs, within the organs, and so on. But usually they'll list just the main four of fire, water, earth, and air, or wind. And so when those elements are out of balance, then the body experiences dis-ease, discomfort, imbalances. And so like Hatha Yoga, Tibetan Yoga, Tibetan breathing exercises, which we'll do later on tonight, as well as meditation exercises, whether we're, we're visualizing images, like visualizing the body as a body of light, which is going to be used a lot in this book, or other types of visualizations, or also just resting in certain qualities of mind, are all geared towards bringing the body into balance and alignment with a balanced mind. And he says, this is on page 13, in the middle, Tolkutundup says, according to this view, when the four elements are in balance, we are in our natural healthy state. But when they are in disharmony, emotional or physical disease can take root and flourish. The third Dodrip Chen writes, this, The ancient masters said that if you do not foster dislike and unhappy thoughts, your mind will not be in turmoil. If your mind is not in turmoil, the air or the energy of your body, meaning the prana, right, the prana or the lung in Tibetan, will not be disturbed. If the air or prana is not disturbed, other physical elements of your body will not experience disharmony. Harmonious elements, in turn, will help the mind stay free from turmoil. Then the wheel of joy will keep revolving. I love that image of the wheel of joy, almost like a, 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 a wheel of uh, the, um, the mill, you know, the grinding, the wheat. The water keeps flowing and then it has a natural... Uh, circular momentum to it that it doesn't just putter out. And so in a sense, the positive, balanced elements in the body, also kind of um, a kind mind and heart help to fuel that uh, wheel of joy that can keep revolving. So this quote is very interesting. It's something that I also learned back in, in when I first started studying Dharma is that when the when we start learning meditation, we learn the importance of sitting as still as possible, right? And that's not always an easy thing to do. But over time, we're able to sit with more and more stillness. And that has a natural influence on the flow of prana in the body. So my teachers would always say, rest in stillness, and when the body is nice and upright, or if you're in supine, you know, if the spine needs to be lying down, as long as it's straight, if the body is relaxed yet integral, not a rigid straight, of course, we always talk about the natural S-curve distributing weight and gravity, then the prana is free to flow more in a balanced way. And if the prana is allowed to flow in a balanced way, the, not, the channels are straight, the nadis are straight, the prana can flow through those channels, and if that's happening, then the mind feels at ease. The mind is at balance. The mind is kind of straight, for lack of a better word. Um, the mind is clear and balanced and unified with 
the prana unified with the body, the channels. And so this threefold relationship is very important for us to understand. And so when the body is still and the prana naturally settles in its natural rhythm, then the mind is able to settle in its natural state. That's why we do the practice called settling the body, speech, which also means breath, and mind in their natural state versus the habitual state, right? Now, this isn't to say that all of our physical challenges will just be healed if the mind puts on a happy face. Like, I don't want to perpetuate that myth. Um, for a lot of us, if we've dealt with challenges, uh, we know that the mind can only do so much, you know. I often, from time to time, I will have students ask me, like in more private interviews, you know, I why am I suffering? Why am I the one who has this disease? I feel like, what have I done to deserve this? Do I have negative karma? And I, oh, more and more, because of my life experience, I try to communicate with them, don't take that on. But don't, don't take so much responsibility for that. It's In a way, it's kind of a new age head trip, this whole thing of like, well, if only I could be positive or purify my mind, I'll be happy and everything will be perfect and my, my disease will be healed. Sometimes we genuinely need to take medicine. Sometimes we genuinely need to seek help and get medical guidance. So nowhere does Tolkutundab advocate just heal the mind and all else will come. So I want to make sure that we all understand that he's not saying that, I'm not saying that. But there are some things we can influence, right? So if we can influence some things, then why not give that a chance? And then, in terms of the mind also being a source of negativity, which I think we, we might understand too well, intimately, the Buddha also said, um, no, Shantideva, the great author of the Bodhisattva way of life that you've studied with Eve a while back, Shantideva is a Mahayana teacher from India. He says, the Buddha who tells the truth says that all fears and all the immeasurable m miseries are facilitated by the mind. So here we are again, kind of in the trap of perhaps thinking, well, it's just all in my mind. So that's in essence uh, not what they're saying here. What they are saying here and what he gets at later in the chapter is that from a Buddhist lens, from a Buddhist perspective, the root illness is clinging onto a separate sense of self. And from that root, misperception, from that root of clinging, a whole myriad of delusions arise. So that is a pretty big healing path that we have to go to to start to uproot or heal that core delusion, which is thinking that I am, Chandra is really an independent, separate ego that needs to be protected, defended, justified, revered, whatever, you know, the ego, we could say. And um, so that's pretty heavy dharma. I mean, that's something that gets thrown around a lot, but it's not so easy to say, okay, well, I'll just do like a three-day long weekend retreat and I'll uproot my ego, <laughs> you know. But I think it is an invitation for us to ponder in what ways does our um, clinging to a separate sense of self, of ego, the I and mine, which is the common way of putting it, clinging at I, the sense of I, the letter I, and mine lead to all myriad of challenges. And that's something we can contemplate and we can kind of piece by piece start to realize for ourselves, yeah, you know, very often I'm better off if I'm not clinging to or stuck in this reification of um, Chandra or Paul or Sophie or, you know, this sense of the name and the thing we have to prop up or what our parents wanted us to be or who I'm, what my true self, my potential I was supposed to be, but I failed everyone. 
You know, it's not really aligning with the truth of what's really here right now. So, uh, Tolkutundup talks about this sense of um, the Buddhism. I'm on page 17 now. And many of the world's other wisdom traditions, he says, this is in the middle of 17. Uh, the root of all our problems is the grasping of the mind. The Buddhist term for this is grasping at self, in quotes. This can be somewhat tricky for Westerners to comprehend. For one thing, the common understanding of self is an I or an ego. In the Buddhist view, self includes me and mine, but is also very much broader and encompasses all phenomena arising in our consciousness. However, according to the highest understanding of Buddhism, there is no self that truly exists as a solid, fixed, unchanging entity. Yeah, so the experiences of I and mine, the thoughts, the desires, the fantasies I have about I and mine, you and yours, and all of that is a part of this kind of construct of the ego, but it's also all the other things. Remember the five skandhas, if you don't have those memorized by now. <laughs> I would be surprised, but that's okay. I don't expect you to have those memorized, but we've talked about this kind of ad nauseum, right? The five skandhas, what makes up who we are, like the Buddha taught, of form, feeling, perception, volitional action, meaning karmic propensities, and consciousness. So that's what he's talking about in terms of what makes up the sense of I and mine. Um, and the thing that's brilliant about Dharma is they kind of burst the bubble of the self, but we're still here. <laughs> you know, like my bubble of ego fixation got popped a long time ago, but Chandra's still here. I'm still aging. I still have my kids. I'm still talking to you right now. It doesn't mean we disappear if we obliterate the ego. <laughs> but what we do understand is there's more fluidity, you know, less um, solidity, less of a trap, less being stuck in in boxes of who we think we should be or who we other people think we should be. So it's actually very liberating. Uh, that's my experience, and that's what it's meant to be. A couple more things, and then I'll guide you in meditation. Another quote from Shantideva, he says, All the violence, fear, and suffering that exist in the world come from grasping itself. What use is this great evil monster to you? If you do not let go of the self, there will never be an end to your suffering. Just as if you do not let go of a flame with your hand, you can't stop it from burning your hand. Yeah. And then the Buddha himself said, when you see with your wisdom that all the compounded phenomena are without a self, then no suffering will ever afflict your mind. <laughs> then um, this is the right approach, the approach that cuts off all the pains of craving. So he's talking about cutting at the root or pulling up the root of this sort of diseased plant of the so-called separate sense of self. So really what that is, is it functions as grasping. So how can we feel this in our body, feel this in our experience? Whenever you are in meditation and you ex notice a thought bubbling up and then there's that secondary moment of the mind grasping onto that thought. That's what the Buddha is talking about here. That's what Shantideva and Tolkutandip are talking about here as the, the kind of the, the, this knee-jerk reaction to grasp onto everything that appears in the mind as being true or real or have even worth following after is an illness. Because we're, we're then we're identifying on with that. And then everything else that follows after, it can either be virtuous or non-virtuous. Of course, there's a lot of good that comes from a healthy sense of ego and who you are, a sense of who you are and who you're not. But the Buddhists, this is what they're talking about when they talk about ego. And I've talked about this before in other classes. The Tibetan for ego 
is literally in English, you would say self-grasping. Duck is self, zin is grasp or to grasp. So grasping at self. That's what the early translators translated into ego. So I like Dachshund a lot better because it really tells us, oh, it's not that I have a sense of self that's so bad. It's that I grasp at it. I reify it. I think it's really the only thing that I am. Does that make sense? Okay. Anyone not understand that or have a question about this? Because this is kind of the premise of his teachings, of Dharma teachings in general. Uh, so if anybody wants to just clarify something now before I go on to lead a meditation, feel free to do that. I know a lot of this is familiar. What's cool is that he's taking Dharma and now putting it through um, almost like I see the color blue of the Blue Medicine Buddha lens. Right? So now we're taking all of our Dharma study and practice, and we're going to use that for healing explicitly. And then lastly, another quote from a Buddhist scripture. What is healing from sickness? It is the freedom from grasping at I and mine. So let's, let's see, let's see. So there will be more chapters to read. There's about four more chapters, five more chapters to read before you get to part two where all the meditations are. But I'm going to jump ahead now and I'm going to guide you through his first healing meditation. And if you're curious, you can find it on page 74 of Boundless Healing, the book that we're focusing on. You could read it later or you can always listen back to these recordings on YouTube. If you want to sit and be guided again and again through it, you have access to this class and all the other classes on YouTube. So let's go ahead and shift gears now and find a comfortable position, either seated or lying down. Make sure your notifications are off, that your space is quiet as possible. And this first meditation is called uh, Bringing the Mind Back to the Body. And what I'll do is I'll guide you through the first part. It has four parts. The first part is bringing calmness to your body. Then the next part is dispelling uneasy sensations. So sometimes we, we don't want to, but we feel uneasy in meditation. So he has some nice techniques for working with that. If you don't have uneasy feelings, you might as well just learn it because inevitably, who knows, you might have uneasy feelings in the future. So we're kind of doing our own practice, but also surveying the land and seeing what's in our toolbox here. The next uh, part, the third part, is grounding the floating mind. I like that one. How, how many people tend to float in meditation? <laughs> like a butterfly fluttering from thought to thought. So he has a nice technique for grounding the floating mind. And then the last stage is being at one with the feeling of calm. So that gives you a sense of what we're going to do here. And during that third stage, I'm going to enhance it a bit with um, uh, kind of going more deeply into the breathing technique that he teaches us because I've had somebody in this class ask if I could do uh, that breath again and it's basically similar to what he introduces to, f to ground the floating mind. So we'll spend a little more time with some gentle breathing exercises to facilitate the meditation. Okay, so allow the eyes to close and Turn inward, feeling the inner space, the inner atmosphere.
Making sure you're in a comfortable position that you can hold with relative stillness for about a half hour or so. And take some deep intentional breaths and soften any holding or tension with the out breath. You may notice tension in your face or your the base of your skull, your jaw. Just keep breathing deeply for a few more moments and release tension with the out breath. Maybe the shoulders can relax the chest or the belly, the belt line soften. Feel your seat beneath you. Relax the hips, the feet. If you're in a chair, feel your feet square against the floor. The chest is slightly lifted, shoulders down the back. But be careful not to tense up. And then feel the chin draw slightly back towards the throat, lengthening the back of the neck. Bring the tip of the tongue to rest against the upper palate. and soften the lower molars away from the upper molars. We can silently give rise to our own personal motivation for this session. May it bring healing, calm, satisfaction within the body-mind, your own personal prayer. And gently now moving into this first stage of bringing calmness to your body, recognizing that your mind can create a feeling of calm. And so let your mind generate calmness in your body by thinking, let my body be calm. Think and feel that your whole body is calm. And give your permission to feel very calm and relaxed. Let my body be calm. Let my body be calm. Now slowly go from one part of your body to another, deepening the feeling of calm. Start with the soles of your feet and bring awareness of calm there. And then expand this feeling of calmness to your feet and actually feel that your feet are calm. And then go on slowly to your legs, feeling your legs calm, relaxed.
up through the hips into your bowl of the pelvis, feeling them calm, relaxed. And your abdomen, your low back, Feel them calm. Your upper body. Up to your shoulders. And feel that your arms and your hands are very calm. Relaxed. And then bringing your awareness up to your neck and feeling a calm, relaxed quality there in your neck. And feel your head is calm face relaxed, the scalp relaxed and calm, and bring awareness of calm also to your brain, which is usually so busy with thoughts and plans, and enjoy the feeling of calmness and peace there. If there are certain areas of your body that are feeling more tense, maybe the shoulders or the neck, simply bring awareness of those muscles to those muscles and tell them it's okay to let go and feel completely relaxed and calm. And when you feel complete in each part of your body, then bring your awareness to your whole body again and enjoy the feeling of your bodies being one in deep calmness and peace. Enjoy the feeling of your bodies, calm and peace. From the crown of the head to the soles of your feet. And now think and feel that everything around you is also calm, as if an aura of calmness were filling the room. And now feel that the whole 
town or city you're in, or the countryside where you live, is calm, at peace, expanding that out. And even expand your awareness even more now to the whole nation. Feel that the whole nation is filled with calmness. If it helps, you can even say a phrase let the whole nation be calm. Let the whole nation be calm. And then expand that feeling to the whole earth. May the whole earth be calm. Maybe you feel it like light surrounding the earth or a blanket of calmness enveloping the whole planet however you feel and sense that calm spreading and enveloping the world go with it And then let that expand even more to fill the entire universe. May the whole universe be calm. Feel that everything is calm and peaceful. And enjoy the feeling of boundless calm and universal peace. Now there may be times in meditation, either this one or other times, you find yourself meditating, where you may experience an easy sensation such as boredom, suffocation, worries, pressures, or pain. And when that happens, you can use the following technique. So with a calm disposition as much as possible, then feel and acknowledge the presence of the uneasy sensation and recognize its particular quality. Now if you naturally didn't have that in you, you might just as a thought experiment bring to mind an uneasy feeling. It doesn't have to be 10 on the pain scale, you know, it could be mild. For the sake of learning this technique, acknowledge the presence of that uneasy sensation, recognizing its particular quality, maybe it's hot or cold, maybe it has a color or a location in the body, the texture, See or feel where this sensation is located in your body, such as the stomach, chest, or head. And vi visualize and feel that all of the uneasy sensation has gathered in the form of a dark cloud at the place in the body where the sensation seems to be centered. 
and without grasping at it or pushing it away, just briefly touch that dark cloud with your mind, feeling the uneasy sensation that you have recognized and making sure that it's gathered up in a dark cloud. And now take a couple of deep and forceful breaths and expel the dark cloud with your outgoing breath, out loud or silently in your mind. With each expelling breath, say, ha, 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 and visualize and feel that the dark cloud with its uneasy sensation is totally expelled from your body. You can do it a few more times here. Ha. 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 And without a trace, feel, sense, visualize that it's completely left the body expelled from your body and take a moment to enjoy the feeling of your body feel that it is free of that unease and it feels calm and then visualize the dark cloud that left you as hanging in front of you in space a couple of feet away, still blazing with the energy of the uneasy sensation. Now see the cloud floating slowly away through space, like a balloon drifting off. And keep watching the dark cloud float and feel that any uneasy sensations are floating away with it. Allow any uneasiness to drift away. And the farther the cloud floats from you, that much freer are you from the energy of the uneasy sensation. As if you were walking away from the heat of fire. Recognize whatever feeling of relief you're experiencing now. And visualize the dark cloud as becoming smaller and smaller, like a bird flying away at a great distance. And now the dark cloud has floated miles away or even hundreds or thousands of miles away. And you are totally losing connection with the dark cloud and that feeling of uneasiness. At the farthest horizon, the cloud becomes as small as a tiny dot. Finally, it becomes completely dissolved without a trace. And keep looking at that place in the clear, open sky where the dark cloud has totally evaporated and enjoy the openness and purity of the sky with no trace of the cloud. And allow your mind to touch the freedom of your body, which no longer harbors the uneasy sensation, and relax in that feeling. Let your body feel newly awakened, 
calm and peaceful without worries or pain. And now there are other times when you might feel a different sensation in meditation where your mind might be floating or scattered. So for the sake of learning, I'm going to guide you through an experience of how to work with the floating mind. This is called grounding the floating mind. So when or if you find yourself feeling scattered or anxious or jittery or experiencing any other floating sensation, you can ground your mind by bringing your awareness to touch or by bringing your awareness of touch of your body on your seat. So forget all other mental objects and feelings Just feel the touch of your body on the seat beneath you. And now think and feel that you are not only sitting on a chair or a cushion, but that you are firmly seated on the earth. Feel the touch of your body on the earth. The earth is firm, solid, heavy. It's unmovable and unshakable. And feel these qualities of the earth's energies. And feel not only that you are touching these earth energies, but that your body is also being filled up with them. Your whole body feels firm, solid, heavy, unshakable, strong, and unmovable. and feel that you are united with these positive earth energies and that your body is now firm and calm. For grounding, You could also visualize a heavy golden statue of the Buddha or a majestic mountain of rock. Feel the heaviness of the object again and again. And then relax and open awareness of the heaviness, the solidity, the groundedness within you and around you. And another grounding technique is to use the breath, a natural, gentle breath, but bringing the air down through the respiratory system and then holding a little breath at the bottom of the abdomen, like you're holding the breath in your belly, below the navel, and a little 
pressing down from above and a pulling up from below, meaning the perineal floor. So we're going to do this for some time. This is what's called the, the vase breath, or the gentle vase breath, the jamlung. So we'll spend some time as a way to teach you so that you can do it when you need it, when the mind is floating or the body's just feeling like it needs some stabilizing. You can do this practice. So become aware of the flow of the breath in the body. And notice that as you breathe in, it feels like you're pouring water into a vase and it fills the torso from the base to the middle to the top as you inhale. And then as you exhale, it's as if you're pouring water out of the vase from the top to the middle to the bottom, emptying completely. Just feel that pouring in with the in-breath, the water filling the vase from the bottom to the middle to the top, and then pouring the water out of the vase as you exhale from the top, middle to the bottom. Just do that for three more rounds of your natural breathing cycle. Breathing through the mouth or nose, usually it's the nose with this practice. The tongue is at the upper palate just like before. If you know the ujjayi or triumphant breath, you can do that now. If not, all it is is a gentle constriction at the base of the throat. A very, very slight constriction to slow the breath down and it creates like a hissing sound. Perhaps you can hear my example. It's very subtle, unforced. So the practice is to have a even in-breath and out-breath, maybe three to five counts with the in-breath, and then three to five counts with the out-breath. So I'll count to five. If you can't do five, that's okay. Just go at your own pace. Let's inhale together. One, two, three, four, five, exhale, one, two, three, four, five. We're not holding the breath or pulling up at the perineum yet. We're just getting the rhythm of the breath, inhaling, three, four, five, exhaling, pouring out, two, three, four, five. Now we'll start to implement a hold at the top of the in-breath, breathing in just like before. And when you're full, hold the breath for a bit. Draw the chin down. Let the belly go soft, almost like you have a beach ball at your navel. And then exhale to three, four, five, relaxing the navel. Again, inhale, one, two, three, stay relaxed, and five, hold the breath gently in. You can even swallow, chin down, perineal floor draws up, Press down from above, meaning right at the diaphragm. Presses down gently, and you've got this ball of energy at the hara, at the navel center. And then exhale, two, three, four, five. Inhale, one, two, 
three, four, five, holding in, chin down, swallow. Perineal floor, meaning you're trying not to pee. It's like that little lift at the perineal floor. Then a gentle pressing down at the at the diaphragm, down like you're packing the energy into the navel center. Relax the mind. And then when you're ready, exhale gently like silk, smooth out breath. Don't push it out. And again, inhale. Two, three, four, five. Holding. Two, three, drop at the perineal floor, press down from above, and then exhale, two, three, four, relax the perineal floor, relax the belly, again, inhale, sipping in the breath, filling the vase, the kumba, when you're full, swallow, pressing the prana down into the hara, chin, slightly draws towards the collarbone, lift at the perineal floor, press down a little bit from above, let the belly soften out, relax the belt line, circulate the prana at the hara, and then exhale, two, three, four, five, again, inhale, two, three, four, Five, holding, relax the mind, don't grip, don't be tense, soft, relaxed, calm body, mind. Even just holding the breath for a little bit if everything else is too much. And then exhale, two, three, four, five. Inhale, two, three, four, five, holding in. Swallow, chin down, press down from above, pull up from below, circulate your prana at the hara. This is a longevity practice, long life, good health. And then exhale, two, three, four, five. Last time, inhale, drinking in the breath. Hold, if you can, swallow, chin, pull up from below, press down from above, feel the ball of chi or prana at the hara, then exhale, relax, everything as the breath flows out. Good, now just breathing naturally, let go of any control of the breath. Is feeling the after effect of the pranayama, the breath work. It's called the gentle vase breath. The vase is the belly. In some contexts, it's that bowl of the pelvis, the hara. On a more subtle internal aspect, it's the central channel. And that's what we're doing, in fact. We're balancing the prana and gently coercing it to enter into the shushumna, the central channel. But for now, just breathe naturally and feel the flow of prana through the body, the free circulation of prana. If there is any tension in the mind or body, let it release. Feeling the breath in its natural rhythm and this final stage now, the fourth stage, being at one with a feeling of calm. When you feel complete in the exercise of bringing the mind back to your body, then notice and enjoy any feeling of calmness in your body as a result of meditation. And just relax in that state of open awareness of the calm feeling without grasping at it or analyzing it. And let yourself merge with the feeling of calm 
and remain in oneness with it, in silence, like water merging with water. We'll sit quietly for a few moments. And then we'll bring our session to a close, again making a personal internal prayer of dedication, the benefit of all beings, and not leaving yourself out of that equation. This meditation may be of benefit, and we offer that up. And in a sense, we can feel that calm again spreading throughout the entire universe, the healing power meditation. Thank you. So begin to open your eyes and come back. So I'd love to hear from you. I'll just kind of recap while you're getting you know, ready. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, I'd love to hear how that was for you. So these techniques of the uh, bringing the mind to the body, calming the mind into the body by touching the feet, the legs, the hips, the back, and all of those parts of the body, that's one tool, right? And then if the... Uh, the, if you have an uneasy feeling in the body, wherever, or in the mind, no matter what meditation you're doing, you can do that dark cloud visualization and then expel it with the ha, 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 <laughs> yeah? And then see it evaporating, you know, and feeling yourself free of that feeling. If that worked for you, you could do that again. And then there, the other uh, solution to a floating mind is this grounding the earth, uh, feeling the body on the seat, that quality of stability of the earth within you. And then also the breath, the vase breath that we did is another grounding uh, practice. So if you enjoyed that, you can implement that at any time, actually. You can do it by itself even. And um, and then this final stage is just being at one with a feeling of calm. It's that feeling of just resting in that open awareness, similar to the way we rest after the four steps of feeding your demons, right? The fifth is the resting and awareness. So again, it's like letting that quality of calm or peace or quietude suffuse yourself. So these are aspects that you can bring into any of the other stages of meditation that we'll explore while we're doing this book study group. So I'm curious, how did that feel for you? This is a little bit of a departure from what we usually do. And then again, it, in a way, it's not. We've got about 10 minutes, so feel free to unmute. If you can, I, I, don't, I think we can do that right. Or you can chat in a question if you want. And if the group in the room wants to, to, to ask a question, you can use the mic as usual as well. Maybe before you ask your question or make your comment, say your name so we can learn your name. Hi there, are you able to hear me? Yeah, really good. Hi, uh, thanks Chandra for leading that. Yeah. And for everyone for being here, that face breath, oh my gosh, I could really feel it. And it's a lot easier for me to stay with my breath when I'm holding it. I could just feel the energy there. 
Yeah. Um, so that was really powerful. I'll say I struggled with parts of the first exercise. I appreciated a lot what you said about um, new age beliefs or like light and othering darkness. I was raised with a lot of spiritual bypassing and that mm -hmm. exercise around visualizing the darkness and then sending it away. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of resistance to that. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I like Tang Len is the balance of like the sending and the receiving. Yeah. Um, so hearing more about how that's actually, you know, I appreciated you said that that's not what he's meaning by it. Mm hmm. And maybe connected, I'll say, to with the um, imagining the world calm, imagining my body calm, that was working. When I imagined the nation, yeah, <laughs> something around that as opposed to like sending the wish or the aspiration, like the imag imagining it was, I felt like I was erasing a bunch of suffering. Right. Um, again, that was just my experience, but I wanted to share that. I'm glad you brought that up. I had that sense too. I was kind of like, okay, so now you, we're going to tell you how to deal with uneasy situations, <laughs> which might be a result of just trying to imagine our nation calm, <laughs> right? It's like I would have to ha ha that out a little bit. Um, so I appreciate that. I'm I'm glad you enjoyed the vase breath. That's wonderful. Keep with it. You know, take what works and then leave what doesn't. Um, I know I recognize the othering of the darkness and the prioritizing of the lightness, and I've always had an issue with that. You have that in Tonglen too, by the way, you know. So it's good to invert that and to um, kind of abolish or practice the somatic abolitionism um, and change that paradigm too. Uh, so I'm open to that, and I think we should talk about that. But I also I also know that sometimes the, that sometimes we do need to just ha ha something out, but it does in a way seem like a temporary uh, solution maybe. You know? I, I mean, I tantra is all about alchemy and transmuting the poisons into medicine, so that's more of my my jive, you know. Uh, but he must have found that this is beneficial for people, you know. Yeah, go ahead. I will say. I had discomfort in a very particular place in my body. And then when I did that practice, it actually did reduce greatly um, oh, for a good. bit. So that also happened. My, Maybe you can see it as a different color. <laughs> yeah. Purple or whatever. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Thank you. Go ahead. That's all? Yeah, welcome. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate that. What was your name? I, I didn't get your name. It's hard for me to see because it's it's quite small. His name is Alex. Hi. Okay, great. Thanks, Alex. It's so helpful when people share. It's like the rose and the thorn, right? Like what worked for you and then what didn't work for you? I think a lot of us benefit from that. Oh, I, I see. We have some chats here, too. Uh, Melissa says, thank you. Question, with the vase breathing, can you place your hand at the level? Yes, the level that we bring the breath down. I remember learning it and the monk said I would get a big belly. <laughs> but I, I would not care. I was very young, so I was concerned about getting a big belly. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, that's, that's funny. That's what the Rinpoche also told us when we learned that breath. He said, now you might get a kind of a round belly from this. So if you f care about your hourglass figure, <laughs> don't do this breath. <laughs> but honestly, I think that you'd have to do it a lot to get that big belly effect. It's kind of like the jolly old belly, you know, the, the old, r the good luck Buddha that you would rub. You know, he's been doing va vase breath for maybe countless eons. <laughs> but you want me to show on the body where you bring the the breath down is that what you asked or can you hold yes yeah, yeah. Okay. can you hold your hand i mean first i thought you meant can we put our own hand on our belly so it helps us tra trace that and i was going to say yes by all means um but then also really you're you're bringing it down to well the hara so you can find it yourself i've got a black dress on i can't show you but um four finger widths beneath the level of your own belly button is um, and then press in into the center of your pelvic bowl, right? So just in from that 
skin of the belly, four finger widths down from the belly button and then in to the middle of the pelvis is this magical place. And so that's where we're breathing. The, we're imagining that the breath, now the breath literally doesn't go down there, right? Because it just fills the lungs. But as we inhale, you might be familiar with the anatomy, that as we inhale, the lungs expand, the rib cage expands, and the diaphragm descends beneath the lungs, pulling the lungs open, and that pushes down. And that's what can make the belly go out, which is what we want right now. And so... Um, that juncture, four finger widths beneath the navel and then in, is said to be where the two side channels exit from the central channel. And what we're doing with pranayama, whether it's kundalini yoga or Tibetan yoga, all forms of this yogic alchemy practice that came from India or South Asia, um, is geared towards consolidating the prana into the central channel and so that's why we imagine that we're breathing the breath down into that area and we actually sort of like imagine uh, the winds kind of circulating there in the hara and building in their strength because this is like a long life practice right bill we're building our prana at the hara that navel center the dantian in chinese hara is sanskrit and then if we're lucky or if we do it enough and the karmic seeds are ripe, the prana will then consolidate into the central channel and rise up through the central channel. And that's when the duality of the sun and moon, the yin and the yang, become non-dual and we enter into samadhi. So that's more of a yogic explanation of what we're doing. Now, he doesn't go into all of that in the book. You know, He's keeping it real simple on a certain level so far. But that's, um, that's what we're doing with the yogic breathing of the Vas breath, even that simple breathing. You don't even have to get too busy with the long hold. You can even just hold it for a couple counts and then breathe out as soon as you feel the pull to breathe out. You don't want to get tense. You don't want to let um, the body get gripped or the mind get tense with this. So breathe in a pattern it's conducive to your calm and relaxation. Okay, um, Melissa, so sorry. Um, that's all right, no problem. Glad you're here. Maybe your kid could learn the vase breath too. Uh, Denise, the ha-ha-ha brought me laughter as well as moving the cloud away. That's nice. Tonight was fabulous again. Thank you. Good. Marianne, in the dark cloud meditation, when you told us to let it float away, the cloud changed into a speck of a dark bird right before you said it. That's cool. The meditation took me there. Very surprising. Yeah, your intuition. You sort of naturally went in that direction. Beautiful. Melissa, so we push it down all the way down to the area of the hara, right? So in a way, it's not like you're pushing necessarily, but you sort of are. You're breathing in and you're feeling the belly expand as the breath is filling the lungs and the diaphragm is descending. And then when you filled, when you're full of breath, you hold it in. If you can, sometimes it's hard, but you swallow. Why? Because that helps to pack the prana down into the hara swallow then drop the chin so it's a bit of a lock at the it's called the jalantara the the root lock i mean not the root the the throat lock so like you're locking in the prana from above and then the mulabandha is the root lock is like it's called um, closing the lower gates or the lower doors so it's like that that feeling that you get when you're trying not to pee you know it's like that but it's five percent of that it's very light let's all just try it right now you're just natural and then start to lift like you're trying not to urinate there's just a little bit of sensation there right in the tibetan yoga as they say even a sensation of bliss might circulate through the channels maybe you feel that maybe not it's okay so that that's that root lock from below is the pulling up from below and then the the instruction of pushing down from above is that quality of like that, you know, where you feel like you're, <laughs> like it's sort of like going like, like that. 
up from below, down from above, and so it's like a, a ball of chi at your hara. And um, sometimes I tell people, imagine that you put your head down in your abdomen, like relax your mind in and then put it right there because it's like about the same size. It's like a bowling ball. It's like the, what is that old scary uh, Halloween story of the, what is it, the, what is that story? I haven't thought of that in years, but we're almost uh, Halloween. I've been thinking about Halloween and, you know, the pumpkin head guy that rides through the forest on a horse. Anyway, don't think about that. But it's like, you imagine that you put your head in your belly and then you relax, <laughs> making Claudia laugh, right? <laughs> the headless horseman, right, right. So imagine you're the headless horseman and you put your pumpkin in your belly. Any other comments, questions? Are you looking forward to diving more into actually healing forms of meditation to help yourselves? How many people feel like, yes, should have done this 50 years ago? <laughs> Yay, good, good, good. Me too, me too. All right, oh, we're at time. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's always a pleasure to be with the SFDC. And I um, I hope that you're all well. I will s not see you next week. Eve will be here next week, and I'll see you after that. So take care and donate to the Dharma community. Even five bucks. From five to five thousand, anything you can give would be much appreciated. And no one has ever turned away for lack of funds, of course. Dharma is priceless, and it's just a joy to be here with you all. So thanks, everybody. I'll, I look forward to being in this beautiful space with you together. And I'm glad to see that the, your dog is, is experiencing a the Dharma as well, in the space. <laughs> did, did, what did the dog do? Did you guys out loud say, ha, 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 and the dog's like, ruff, ruff. <laughs> okay, you can unmute and say bye if you want to. Bye. Thank you, Sean.